Yo, welcome back to another Mailbag Monday by the Money Matters podcast. I am your host, Jack. We are joined full staff with my father, Bill, and my chief of staff, Dylan. How are we doing? Excellent. Excellent as always. I'm outnumbered uh, on the West Coast to Central Time. Dylan is out, uh, out West at Coachella. How is it? Uh, it's fun. It's hot. It's dusty, but uh, it's a good time. It's a little fiat, but it's a tradition. Uh, what does it mean? It's dusty, you know, like a desert. Yeah, it's literally like in a desert. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I've never been. Um, well, that's good. I mean, we're potentially in the middle of war, which I know we'll probably talk about in a second. Um, so quite the weekend, no matter where you are. Uh, but let me do uh, what I need to do before we get into it, real quick. Who sponsors the podcast? Nobody. Uh, we host this ourselves. We've been in Bitcoin for over a decade, at least the Mallers family has. And uh, we just believe in authentic, shoot the shit conversation. Casual, fun, hopefully insightful, entertaining, but super direct, super straightforward, uh, and super honest. That's the whole point. No brand is ever going to pay me for my opinion. Uh, however, if you want to support us, you strike. So real quick on that, I mean, we've seen a ton of growth like more people are using strike and i think just because more people are using bitcoin too but i just want to express my gratitude to our customers uh we're having a ball serving you guys we're having a ball providing you tools as bitcoin becomes more and more important seemingly every single day and we're now testing europe so we are executing btc eur quotes for customers it's not public yet we're looking to make the product public maybe in a few more weeks so if you want to support us, definitely download Strike. I mean, we've got free Bitcoin withdrawals, Lightning Network support, some of the che cheapest spot Bitcoin pricing in the world. We're in 70 markets. I think we're probably one of the best in the world at Bitcoin, especially for retail consumer wallet. So download it, give it a try. And for everyone in Europe, I just got back from Bedford, Peter McCormick's podcast. And so a lot of folks from the UK and the EU there, the love that we get out there I think is more than American. And I don't know why that is the case. I have, I'm building some thesis that I'm not totally sold on yet, but uh, I just, it means the world to me to get uh, all of the love and support when I cross the pond. And I'm really excited to bring our products there. So we're coming soon and uh, that's how you can support us. But um, this is a unsponsored podcast. So you're getting real deal shit. Uh, now to get into the episode last week, we did a segment by my dad called Dollar Bill, which is his market analysis. He's been in financial markets for over 40 years. He's the most talented Bitcoin trader I've ever seen personally, and I've seen a lot of them. And then we choose one topic to spend the rest of the episode on. So today you're going to get a Dollar Bill segment, his market analysis, and we're going to weave in a little bit of what the fuck's going on with World War III, how do you trade a war, what's his opinion of what's going on with the weekend market activity. And then the one topic we're going to talk about is Bitcoin open source development. There's been some words from Matt O'Dell. There's been some words from Michael Zeller or lack thereof. I don't know. Um, I've shared my thoughts that are not directed at anyone individually, but just my experience of being in Bitcoin and what open source development means to me. And I've collected some tweets and just some posts on Reddit and other social medias that I wanted to respond directly to, hopefully to be a contributor to the conversation. Uh, and give, you know, I'm just a note on the network, but we'll talk about that. So that's the agenda of the episode. I hope you guys enjoy. And with that, Dollar Bill, Dollar Mr. Bill is what my friend <laughs> used to call him when I was a kid. Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill, Dollar Mr. Bill. Uh, what do you think about the financial markets in particular, the orange coin? Oh, I got it. I mean, I got an answer that I don't know if you guys are going to like. I've always, I was always taught you got to trade around. Uh, it's a big Fed meeting, a big economic data point, or actually, coincidentally, I, I, I had to manage risk around a couple of these um, um, Middle East dust up. It was a, I think it was a Sunday night when we invaded, uh, when we tossed Saddam, right? And um, I literally had to, on a Sunday night, race into the office and give a margin call to everybody who was short gold and crude oil, and then... A day later, I had to give everybody a margin call who was long gold and crude oil, right? Because that thing resolved so quickly. Um, my, I guess my point is um, trading around an event like this 
I, I give you I give the same advice I always got. One of two things. Either trade the way you were going to trade. Ignore it. Um, that um, If you're a technical trader and, and, and this market's in an uptrend, unless it violates some support level or something, then trade accordingly. Um, either ignore it or even up and take this week off. I got no problem with either of those answers. I guarantee you, this is one of those days where your grandfather would walk into the office and literally unplug the, the television right, <laughs> and say, you guys, do not try to trade around unless, like I said, unless you can phone your extensive contacts at the State Department and give us some insight into what type of response I'm going to have to trade around tomorrow morning. Other than that, I, I don't, I can't. Um, this is not a market I don't think where your technical analysis skills are going to make any type of difference. And and like I said, unless you got some type of insights into what type of response is coming, um, I say one of two things: either ignore it and trade, you know, as if it's not happening. You know, follow the trend. That's what I'm doing. I have not logged into my account, right, Esper? I don't believe I've logged into my account this week. I'm just not going to try to trade around this nonsense. Um, I will let the dust settle uh, and. And I know that sometimes you kick yourself like, God, I, I'd evened up and I lost, you know, the first 5% of, uh, of this. I mean, we've got a halving coming up. How can I not be trading? Yeah, like, I, I don't know. So I, I'll accept either of those answers. But for me, I'm going with answer two. I am out of this market. I have not logged in. That is act, that is my advice, I'd say, to most of your listeners, the majority of your listeners, unless, you, unless you're sitting in front of a screen and, and you don't need to sleep nights. So this is going to be tough to manage to trade your way around. I say, get out either if either even up or like I said, turn the TV off and take the week off. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, what I'm doing. So to be clear, as talented as my dad is at financial markets, I would say I'm not. I don't actively trade. Um, so what I'm doing is just holding my position. Yeah. Uh, just sit in Bitcoin. Uh, it's usually pays off huddle on um but i do have a question for you um so bitcoin oh, well, I, I mean uh, whether to hold or try to trade this i i mean i'll tell you what i'm gonna but you could have guessed what i'm gonna do I, I i do not trade around these events but um i'd be more interested in what your customers are doing are they actively trying are they watching cnn and trying to i tell you this whether this is going to, because that's the question. Is this going, is the whole region going up in flames? Then no, I want to be out of everything. Is this going to resolve? Then yeah, the stock market's going to boom right back. Um, I don't know. What, what are your customers doing? I'll tell you this. Um, they're buying a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, we were hitting like, and even before the news, I think Friday, I think like Thursday was our biggest day in company history. Then Friday was our biggest day in company history. And then on Saturday, I, so I just landed from London. I just had a direct flight from London, Chicago. I got back in the empty closet and we started recording. So uh, it was yesterday I was in London while I was in Bedford with McCormick. And I ran back to the hotel to make sure customers were getting filled during this event because you know, you've got LPs and it's a weekend. And so settling, you, you got to use credit lines. And I was calling all of the LPs and counterparts that we use um, and making sure credit lines were healthy because um, our customers were buying the fuck out of the dip. Um, but we're, we're traditionally very lopsided service. Our customers are, are always net buyers. I don't think we've ever had a day in business where our customers have been net sellers. Uh, but it was pretty violent. It's been violent buying from strike customers, buying the fucking dip, as they say. I mean, other than that, if you take a look at what, like what factors drive Bitcoin, um, you know, monetary policy, upcoming having. I mean, none of that has anything to do um, with a, you know, a war in the Middle East. Um, but, you know, like I said, just kind of trade around it. Um, and my advice, the way to do that is, like I said, just I had no problem with either A or B. Either continue to either turn the TV off and trade the way you always have, or take this week off and break. Right. Yeah. Well, the they always say the hardest thing to do is doing nothing, right? It's very difficult to just. Yeah. I know. Well, you think, hey, I'm speculation um, needs volatility. If there's, if there's no volatility, there's there's no ability 
to make money. And this is this is monster volatility. This is five percent moves up down all day long. This is really where you can make your year right now if you have a good month during you know one of these episodes. Um, so they're I mean, but I, I, this is one of those things. It, it does. It reminds me of of when the whole focus when I you know when I started out as a foreign currency trader, I used to trade um you know, DMARC Swiss, Japanese yen, and the whole focus of that market typically was a trade deficit number. The trade deficit number uh, was the first economic data point released. So you're telling us how, or unemployment number, mm -hmm. you know, so you, that number will come out like less than a week after the month in question. So you're gonna tell me how many jobs were added seven days ago? I, I mean, that's a, it's an impossible guess. But unfortunately, it's going to be the focus. It's the first data point, so it's the focus, and you got to trade around it. Um, and uh, like, you got two choices, right? How do I trade this big economic report that's going to be revised three more times in the coming months? Well, you can either ignore it, right? Even up, ignore it, and try not to trade. Or, um, you know, you can try to trade through it. But I, I've always I, the advice I always got is just don't, don't mess with that. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly that's an economic data point is hard enough um but you know a middle east war i uh, my advice even up um take the week off yeah that's what yeah. i'm doing i was gonna say i was uh at sublime yesterday i noticed the bitcoin price was what like 62 grand i think 62 and a half when i bought and Ooh, i'm good. yeah i mean i'm i'm just such a low type time preference guy so 62 and a half grand bitcoins feels like it's on sale to me so i was i was smashing dips uh any chance that i got <laughs> congratulations yeah i'm gonna uh take some of your commentary turn it into a little bit of a rant and then end it with a question right back at you dad so uh, the volatility is a good thing idea you know i think uh bitcoiners don't advocate for that enough you know sometimes on cnbc they'll say oh it's a volatile and it's not a problem you know volatility is a good thing right um it's it's first of all it's natural and second of all it's a good thing uh, what i mean by natural is that uh you know entropy is there's constant and always entropy um right uh meaning that markets are naturally volatile humans are are naturally gambling. We've talked about this on this podcast and that the central bank, all central banks and all governments have been trying their best to price fix things and take entropy and volatility away from you. Um, and they don't, they don't want the grass to grow outside, but grass naturally grows. And right. And so I, I think um, the fact that Bitcoin is volatile is a very, very good thing for it attracts liquidity. It attracts traders. Um, but it also goes to show that it's one of the only free markets left in the whole world, which I, I kind of want to talk about in a second. Um, and volatility being a good thing is, is just very obvious if you just take a step back and think from first principles. If you're in the lobby on the first floor of a building and I tell you you need to get to the penthouse, but with no volatility, how the fuck are you going to do it? With no volatility, you're going to be stuck on ground floor for the rest of your life. If you want to get to the penthouse, you're going to have to go up. And that's volatile. And so I think volatility naturally means direction, means progress. Um, and so volatility is natural. There's always entropy in the universe. Things are always happening. And the fact that central planners have taken that away from the everyday person is unnatural and dangerous and scary. And the fact that Bitcoin is volatile means it's real, it's authentic, it's honest, and that it's useful and it's good. Uh, and so volatility is your friend. Without volatility, I mean, if you want to be stuck on on the first floor for the rest of your life, but I'm I try and live in the penthouse, right? Like, um, you got you got to absorb volatility. It's your friend. Um, so that is, I just want to make that point, and then combine it with the saying that you've always told me, Dad, is you sell what you can, not what you want in markets of uncertainty. And so to see Bitcoin react like that, what I mean by that is, oh shit, we might be going to war. Well, let me take the top two floors of my commercial real estate building and sell it on a Saturday night. You can't do that. <laughs> you got to sell the whole building or you got to hold on to the whole building. And by the way, if you want to sell a commercial real estate building, you may get lucky if you could sell it in six months. So Bitcoin is so honest. It's so truthful. It's so free and it's so liquid. It truly is the one free market that we have left as a species. Uh, and so it's not necessarily that people are bearish Bitcoin. They're selling what they can 
not what they want. The guy can't sell the top floor of his commercial real estate building. So he has to sell the Bitcoin, even if he's a bull. And so just your commentary, I'm curious what you think about the dip itself, the volatility being good, selling what you can, not what you want. Is that true? Do you find that viable? Or do you think that people are turning bearish all of a sudden because there may be a war outside of the US somewhere? Oh, I think, you know, volatility, the, the history of Bitcoin volatility has been almost always um, exchange failures, liquidation, seizures, government sales, right? Mt. Gox goes down, very volatile day. I think Bitcoin lost a third of its value. Um, Silk Road, you know, seizures, those, um, you know, those tend to be liquidation, exhausting liquidations events and, and definitely, COVID. oh, COVID. I think COVID was a big mover. Um, but um, uh, those, I think, are, you know, are easier, not just retrospect. I think those are easier breaks to buy. After all, a Mt. Gox liquidation is not going to snowball and spiral. I mean, they're, when they're done, they're done, right? I mean, once you take down Silk Road, you can't take it down three more times, right? I mean, it, so those were easier breaks to buy. This does have um, escalation potential, and without... Any other liquid market being open with what's crude oil doing, what's gold doing, what what are the major, you know, stock indexes, financial markets, flight to quality is like, you know, treasuries. I, I you guys can't bomb shit on Saturday morning. I got no, I got no, I'm I'm trading blind right now. Um, so I know I know it's a frustrating answer, but I wish I could, um, you know, wait till markets start filling in on Sunday night. I could get a better feel for the temperature of the financial markets but my hunch is that um anything if, if it's a gold spike or a crude spike that those are rallies that can be sold these things tend mm -hmm. the history of them i mean I've, I've managed risk through a couple of gulf wars um they resolve without spiraling without they they and i'm not trying you know, i'm not trying to be insensitive to um anybody in the, in the service or anybody that's going to have their lives at risk to resolve this thing. But as far as financial markets are concerned, I, I would fade if gold comes in, gold and crude come in too strong. I, I'd be, a, I'd look for it to take some profits or even try the short side there. Yeah. Well, gold, gold uh, looked like the other question I had for you on the dollar bill segment is gold looked like it knew something, which was concerning people that I respect and follow as market analysts is it was trading i mean gold almost at 2400 i think it last yeah. week it rallied well above 23 and i think people are generally excited that a lot of the thesis is confirmed that well high interest rates seem to be inflationary low interest rates seem to be inflationary it seems like global debt's gdp is just a problem and the the fiat currencies are going to need to be debased uh, and gold, seeing gold trade that high was good, but it almost traded so bullish where people started to say, somebody knows something bad's going to happen. Gold doesn't move like this. Uh, and then, and I was like, huh, that's an interesting insight. I guess I've never really been alive and old enough to see gold move like this. Um, I hope nothing bad happens. And then boom, next day, World War III. And I was like, huh, I wonder if some central bank knew that something was going to happen. Um, and to end it, gold in recent years has led Bitcoin as like a uh, expression of fiat debasement. Gold, gold, but Bitcoin's the faster horse. So gold will rally and go up like 3% and then Bitcoin will go up 30%. But Bitcoin's usually slower moving to it. Um, so do you have any thoughts on that? Because it looks like gold knows something. And I mean, to move gold, central banks are probably... Like I, I think the gold bull thesis is that central banks are going to devalue their currencies against the gold that they hold, um, and that's who buys gold. And I don't know what do you make of the gold bull? I oh, think Bitcoin's going to hit 100k based on 2350 gold. You know, markets can be markets can be uh, right, remarkably, in, you know, forward thinking and predictive. Um, I, I just, I, and in an era of you know Nancy Pelosi, where your congressman literally calls a takes a time out and goes and front runs the next vote they're going to make. Well, I mean, guys, I mean, in that in this world, good luck saying, yeah, well, there's 
there's always going to be a couple of bad apples. There's a hundred senators. Now they, they're all crooked. I mean, they all seem to, I, I, I mean, I've never seen, so in a, in, in a world like that, is it, is it possible that somebody bought gold knowing that, uh, uh, I don't think so. I, I just don't, I mean, markets are enormously predictive and intuitive in almost creepy ways sometimes, but no, I, I, I have no reason to think that Ah, this one seemed to come out of left field on a well. It would it would help a lot if other markets were open. You could get right. You, you could kind of get a feel for how much of a shock this is, um, and how much of a and how much spiral out of control potential there is. I have been watching the news all week, and so I can tell you everything that's on the news wires. Um, but markets are and and everything on the news wire. Well. Put it this way um if i'm on cnn um i'm incented to make this as dramatic as possible we are on the verge of world war three do not turn off um but you know so everyone you're getting your news from is incented to make it sound as bad as possible i just want to see a market i don't see a market tell me that it's gonna that it's as bad as everybody on cnn says it is but no i know come on we're gonna what what's the next person that tells me that this is this is basically the gateway to hundred dollar crude. Well, that's going to be a big problem for 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 avoiding a recession and keeping inflation under control. And markets are not going to like you know that type of a race. But if it does what it's done every other mid every other um you know I, Iran Saddam Hussein type of Kuwait dust up, it's it's going to be over in two days. <laughs> and so I'm not buying. I, yeah. I, 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 my advice, I'm taking it off. I haven't logged in. I'm sticking by that. I admire the Dylans of the world. They're going to buy this break. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, plus, I, I really know. hope that trade works out for you. God bless. Because that's, that's got it. You got it. I mean, hit and buy when this thing, it, what, Bitcoin was $3,000 in like an hour, right? I mean, just whoosh. Yeah, you did great. Um, I was going to say the only trader I know better than you, uh, Bill, is Nancy Pelosi. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just find I do not to be the local conspiracy theorist, and I'm not necessarily advocating for it. I just do find it interesting. Like, um, rates have been high for a while, uh, inflation isn't going down, the stock market isn't crashing. So something's inflationary, something is stimulating, and it seems to be the reverse repo facility. And there was always speculation that as soon as that thing runs out of capital, there's going to be a war or there's going to be a COVID 2.0. There's going to be a need for stimulus in an election year to make you look like printing money is a hero that's saving the country and not a villain that's inflating away the lifestyle of the everyday American. And that facility is almost tapped. And so to see the facility, I think gold, Bitcoin, I think people were forward thinking like this facility is running out. Um, and, and so high interest rate, low interest rate, it's all inflationary because of the debt, um, because of the, the budget so out of balance. And uh, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, you know, if I'm Biden, I have to find a way if I want to get reelected, uh, I have to find a way to print money somehow. What he's got, I don't know how many weeks or months he has left to, to pick his narrative um so i'd be curious to see how this stuff shakes out i mean of course i i pray that there's no war i've been very vocal about that i don't believe in supporting any real war unless someone's attacking me out of self-defense i will defend myself but outside of that you know, better shit to do than go hurt you've been saying up. since um, um, you've been saying since episode one though something's gonna happen um, I mean, ever since we started this, he said that, you know, Biden's got to do something. Uh, Dude, we're Matt, $36 trillion in debt. What are, you, what are we looking at? Right, that's real estate prices. The, the lowest number that is on the far left, the highest number is on the far right. Okay. Um, you want to see gold prices? They're within, they're making all-time highs. Bitcoin within 10% of its all-time high or whatever. Um, what, in all those... All three of those markets have separate supply demand fundamentals. Real estate is a lot to do with demographics or taxation. Um, you know, gold is an international market, but they yet all three on their highs or at or near highs, I think, 
they is is they all do overlap. They all are part of a dollar debasement story, right? I mean, they are all mm -hmm. reasonably fixed. Real estate, gold, yeah, we can go. You can dig up more of it if you put if you get the price high enough. We'll go find more. If you get the price high enough of real estate, yeah, you can put another penthouse on top of that building. But you know that takes time and it's hard. Bitcoin easily has the best fixed supply story. I mean, it is auditable, knowable, and it's going to have. Um, so I, I mean, I, I just think I have no problem for rare time in my life. I'm not going to argue with any, with even gold bulls. I just, I, I think in a world where you got a choice between insolvency um, and bank lines or a little extra inflation on an election year, I, I totally agree with Dylan on that one. You guys can go ahead and pay 7% more uh, for your wheat thanks to Putin <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and not the trillions we, uh, no, I, I just keep towing that line and, and just walk this, walk through this mess without triggering more bank lines in an election year. Absolutely. And that's, that puts the dollar at risk. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's just math th at this point. Um, like high, high rates are also really bad because, it makes the debt that the government has to pay look a lot more expensive too. So um, it's just a lose-lose situation. Like uh, the global debt to GDP is my favorite thing to take a look at personally, because you can you think of- that. You go on that one, but just give it a TLDR on that. Like, I don't know, I could bore you and run you through all sorts of M M1, M2, M3 analysis and and you know money velocity and stuff. But just here, here's here's the breakdown, sir. We only got a few minutes. Um, do you do you want to risk um triggering an, an insolvency event or do you want to risk triggering double digit inflation? Neither of them is nice, and both of them have in the history gotten people voted out. I would say, all things being equal, I don't want my voters walking past big bank lines on other way to the polls right that just whatever that's just that i this these people have to go type of thing inflation i think monetary authorities have an easier time blaming that on supply chains or quirks or weather right i remember our, is the fed you know when i was coming on we had it, the stock market was actually reacting to the 88 drought like why um, because the Fed is has a harder time being aggressive on monetary policy when inflation is is going up double digits. Yeah, but it's because of weather or it's because of a supply chain disruption. Um, or so there are just different what type of response this market um gets from the monetary authorities, um, you know, is is gonna be the key to how I trade it going forward. Yeah. Well, I have a slightly, well, no, I mean, I agree. My approach is a little different in that. Um, I mean, I agree. Like the way to get elected is to give people free shit. Uh, and that's just the way it's always been. Like, I think Biden recently came out and said, oh, by the way, if you vote for me, your college debt, you don't owe it anymore. The reality is there's no such thing as free shit you pay for it in other ways in the form of financial repression, but that's how you get elected period. But the, you know, I like the idea of global debt to GDP. I like pushing this narrative that your know, money is best understood as energy and time in an abstracted form. Right. And so you wake up every single day and you spend your energy and your time doing a thing, and then that thing is compensated in money. And so that money that you got in exchange for your energy and time, and so, right, so money is energy and time abstracted. And if you look at global debt to GDP is now over 350%. So the way I think about that is governments have borrowed our energy and time with no way of paying it back. So in theory, that's not always a bad thing. If you can take our energy and time and then create so much more of it where you pay us back plus interest and then we have excess energy and time, then that's how you you know, grow population. Like when someone invests, let's say someone invests in a coffee shop. So I'll give you 
$10,000 to start a coffee shop. And then I return your investment of $20,000 and I have a coffee shop. It's because I took your time and energy, created a coffee shop, paid back your time and energy, and then built my own, right? Does that make sense? So it's not necessarily always a bad thing, but a, a global debt to GDP of over 350% means we're way out of whack and that there is, there's a loss. There's time and energy that's lost. And someone, some, someone's time and energy has to pay that back is the way I like thinking about it, is governments have borrowed time and energy from the populace and they can't make whole on it. So who's paying it back? And another way to think about, well, it's, it's easier to inflate than run people insolvent. Well, because here's the, the government could say we're doing a debt jubilee. We're just going to, we're just going to default and admit we fucked up. Then who, but the problem, but the, but here, hold on. I know Dylan, but here, the thing about it is what's interesting is there, who bears that loss? Who would bear that loss is the bondholders. No, no, you wouldn't Dylan. The bondholders would. Those, if, if we said no debt jubilee, uh, we fucked up. We're, we're starting over. It's those that actually own the bond. Like Jamie Dimon would be the one fucked up. Um, that's, that's the, that's the problem is you have to, like, there is a loss on the balance sheet. Someone has to mark the loss. We're not getting out of this without someone losing. And so what every politician has to figure out is who they want the loser to be. That's the decision that's being made period. And so on one side, it's the big bad bankers are the ones eating the loss. So whose time and energy ha is going to have to go to paying back the world and making us all whole. Or are you taking time and energy away from the general populace? That's just the way I like thinking about it is money is abstracted time and energy. We owe a lot of time and energy. Whose time and energy is going to make the world whole? And that's what politicians are deciding right now actively because they could say, we're going to rebalance the budget. We're going to start over. So all of you guys that are at the masters right now getting paid on five and a half percent interest rates for doing jack dick for the world. You're the ones that lose. They could do that, but they don't, right? Like Jamie Dimon fucked up the world in 2008 and nothing happened. He didn't go to jail. He didn't get Sam Bakeman freed. He didn't get a double life sentence like Ross, right? So they clearly don't like making those guys pay. They usually like making us pay. But that's it's how matter, I like it. Just a matter about who you want to, to stick with the bill of yeah, who's bearing the loss? And screwing up. It's not. It's not a matter of who. Um, I, I just don't think you can practically. I mean, default's not an option. Default spins out of control. The only thing that you can pretty reasonably control is debasing the currency, right? You can't. Con don't play with. Like I said, do not play with bank lines with a, with an economy that is this insolvent in an election year. There's just no way. I. I mean, it's just. It's if, if you have to, you have to. If you know. Some, some regime, some, um, you know, um, the White House passes a balanced budget amendment and Congress, for some reason, decides we're, we're, we're going to do it this time. Um, oh. And yeah, somebody's, but someone's going under, you're going to, you're going to put under, a, you're going to get a, trigger a lot of bank um, runs. Yeah. Um, so why not just because, and the average person seems willing to accept that inflation is, a lot to do with a lot of intangibles um, and not strictly doing to your mismanagement of fiscal policy. I don't disagree with you. I just don't think people understand. Like someone, right. like none of these Muppets running for president are running on, I'm going to balance the budget. Not no. one of Trump didn't say that. Kennedy didn't say that. Biden didn't say that. Ramaswamy didn't say that. None of these assholes ever said, you know what I'm going to do to fix the country? Balance our budget. Make sure that we uh, we don't consume more than than we have. That we, that we're not just perpetually in debt. None of these assholes said that. So for all, oh no, I really like that guy. No, that guy, trust me. That no, that all these guys are full of shit. None of them said, you know what, I'm going to do balance the budget because that's their, our biggest problem is debt. None of them said that. And so I just don't think people generally appreciate that politicians have a decision to make of who's bearing the cost and by by actively not making bondholders who are who are your banks who owns all the bonds banks 
So that means it has to be all of us. And so the reason you own Bitcoin, owning Bitcoin is a way of saying, you're not going to take my time and energy to, to, be, to make everyone else whole on the debt. So you could take, you, yeah, if there's other people out there whose time and energy um, you want to rob, go for it. Uh, you're not taking mine. But I just don't think people appreciate that there is a, te there, like technically there is a decision. I agree with you that in practice, you know, no politician would ever weigh putting Jamie Dimon under as opposed to like the general populace of America that's too stupid to understand any of this. But I think that's just, I just want people to understand that it's not impossible. Someone could run for president and say, I'm going to balance the budget and do a jet debt jubilee and all the big banks that have bought all the bonds over the, all these years are fucked and I'm going to prioritize the people. Now they, they're they not going to get elected, but that's possible. It is possible. Um, right. But, but, you know, another big problem is is the unknown. If if I knew, like, um, if I knew, like, I, I there are reasonable ways that I can tell how employment or taxation or, or, or is going to be affected by um, a rising inflation or, or a rising Fed funds rate. But it's the um, insolvency thing. I, I don't think if you showed me, and I have some fluency, right, in financial markets, you showed me. Bank of America's ba balance sheet and said, could they take a 200 basis points aggressive Fed hike to really put an end to inflation or would they go insolvent? I don't know. I, and they don't know either. Right. I mean, these yeah. things have a, have a tendency to cascade. Yeah. Um, and so you really want to err. I know um, election year is really just a cherry on top. I wouldn't care if it, it what where we are in election cycle. I, I would just be really wary about being aggressive. I mean, you just saw how many rate hikes did it take to trip, right? Silicon Valley Bank and not much. We just, I don't think policymakers knew no. how fragile those banks are. It, yeah, Bank of America is insolvent, technically. If you run their books, they're insolvent it's right now. They're insolvent now. They all are. It, well, that's, I mean, the-, the no like, not be, right? We're, we're all- I mean, we're, we have lender a last resort to backstop you and I got to compete against I got I need employees customers and earnings you know I got to answer to my shareholders um but yeah that, I'm assuming I mean it goes deeper than that it's that the whole game is to buy is that banks take cost uh deposits of the everyday man and they go lend it to the government cheaper than the economy can produce that's the whole game that's rigged is they take our deposits and then they go buy bonds and the bonds are going to yield us if the if the economy is growing at 10 percent, the bonds are only going to pay us five percent which is bullshit if i'm giving you money for 10 percent growth then give me 10 percent. but i mean that's the whole thing but the bond market's jacked the bond market's screwed and that's that's the math so i mean this whole segment here was dylan said i've been waiting for something bad to happen and excuse to print money because i'm just doing math is unless unless someone unless some president is going to say i'm campaigning on balancing the budget which just to show you guys that that's possible that's what happened in argentina the guy that just got elected in argentina ran so eventually people get there's such civil unrest where people are like you know what i'd rather go through total carnage just because but argentina is the most a violent example of Keynesian economics to the extreme. So America's not there yet. It looks like we're probably on our way. There's decent amount of civil unrest. But if you're not going to campaign on balancing the budget, if you're not going to campaign on, you know what, we're just going to wipe the slate clean and all the guys that have um, Hamptons houses for just sitting on fucking assets that just yield them five and a half percent for doing jack all fuck all that have lenders of last resort that can make mistake after mistake after mistake and collapse the economy and never go to jail for it. If we're never going to punish them, um, we're going to have to burden the everyday person, which means inflation, which means they're going to have to debase the currency, debase the debt they owe. And just math. Um, Ask yourself, which, which do you think is preferable even having explained that even having explained that inflation is a stealth tax um which would you like if i say vote for me i'll i'll put it into this inflation stuff i'll balance the budget and if i do that well i mean obviously inflating the currency is one way our government services its debt so if i'm able to end inflation 
I'm sending y'all an extra 20 grand bill for taxation. That it'll be your I ended inflation tax bill. Well, you don't, oh, screw you. I'm not paying 20 grand extra in taxes. Would you rather have your assets depreciated by seven to eight to 10%? It's probably the same number, but I think you can clearly see, no, I will get thrown out of office if I raise your taxes by 20%. Whereas inflation is a more stealthier way to um, accomplish the same thing. So there's your answer. I don't think, I think you're just, you're going to get a continuing um, bump up against the, every politician knows as long as you keep it under double digits, it's not going to run away on you. There are seven, eight, nine, six, five, Putin, supply chains, bad weather, um, 15, 18, 20, you're now. Yeah. Again, I agree with you. I just don't think people understand how it works. I mean, the reality is, That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, the reality is they're going to inflate. The other reality is, to your point, there's no way out. The only that we're going through a reset actively, like it's called Bitcoin, and so this is a new gold rush of the new system. And before you know it, we're gonna have new wealth distribution, new wealth class. I mean, there's already been almost one and a half trillion dollars of new wealth generated from this Bitcoin thing, and so yeah, I agree. I just don't think people appreciate like. You know, how do I know what's going to happen? Because I'm just doing math. I'm just like looking at the numbers. And like, I mean, what do you do? What I mean, Paul Volcker uh, is right, the poster child for the way to run a central bank and to take over the central bank in the 80s and, and put the prime rate at 19%. There was no doubt that the economy was going to suffer one of the worst recessions. Um, 1982, I was just getting out of college and it was bleak. Um, but he laid the groundwork for, right, the 80s, 90s were, um, I don't know how much credit you want to give, but that, but if had we dragged in the monetary sloppiness of the 70s, right, um, you know, devaluing dollar and soaring gold and um, in real estate and everything, um, but the Volcker Fed ability and the courage to put the brakes on that. So it is, it is really set the stage for a terrific decade for financial assets, um, for paper assets. Can it, do we have a hero lurking out there somewhere? It's, it, it's possible. You can't mm, it, well, just say, but I'm, I, I mean, if I it wanna, comes, let's, let's, let's put Fed funds at 19% and put a break to all this so that, you know, your kids will, won't have the inflation that you have. And that takes a lot of political will and courage. And I just don't think there's a there's a heroic Volcker or Greenspan hanging around in, in this crowd right now. <laughs> this, these people seem to be managing the policy with a, a knowledge that they got to be careful of the insolvency risk far more than than those than the Fed was in the 80s. Well, then it feels yeah. too far gone. It feels too far gone to, to to fix. I feel like at this point it's it's maintenance. Well, hold on, let me let me ask a question real quick because the right. Fed Jerome Powell doesn't have any power anyway. The Fed um doesn't run things anymore. Uh, the government they're they're reactive to the government. The Treasury Yellen is the one that calls the shots. The I think the issue is that the U.S. government's in far more debt now than they were. The, I think mean, right. That's so I don't think you blame the central bank. Jerome Powell's job's the worst in the world. Um, he raises rates, inflation. He lowers rates, inflation. He's fucked. It doesn't matter. Um, so I, I think it's just government spending. It's just that I think it's the fall of the American empire. We've talked about that. Dorsey tweeted that like a year ago, is that the empire has easy productivity gains in the early days because maybe they're coming off a war or some innovation of the country. And then eventually it exhausts itself and they don't know how to slow down and get back to reality and governments are greedy and they abuse stuff. That's. I mean, I guess, no, there, I, I agree with the premise that there's no real right answer for monetary policymakers, but there certainly is a wrong answer. There is a way to get, make this a lot worse. There's no way to fix it, but there is a way to make it a lot worse. And, and in the macro, I, you know, I'm going to have to negotiate my way around an enormous amount of debt. Um, an election year, a possible Mideast war, 
um, I I'm, I'm, am going to err on the side of not letting defaults start popping. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I agree with that take. I just don't think that there's like a different guy that we need. And I reserve the right to change it five minutes from now. As you know, I would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I don't. Old, old, I haven't disagreed with lower because everybody dumped on that rally. Um, yeah, maybe you know the market is not ready to start accepting higher inflation and we still do have confidence in financial policymakers I, I i mean it just seems like it's kind of changing right i mean who in the world how can you rally gold gold is the most um you you are the proud and right monetary authorities that put gold at a record high and i've never seen gold ha hold a rally in my career it is wow gold is a haven against uncertainty okay how about the 87 stock market crash? How about the Gulf Wars? There, how about impeachments? There's been plenty of uncertainty in my career, and gold never protected you from any of it. Short term, maybe, but then it always comes back. Um, it's not a good protector. And that's why, I, I, in a weird way, I'm I'm far more fixated on, on the price of gold than I am the price of Bitcoin or stock in those DEXs right now. Because um, I really have never, I've seen gold, you know, temporarily elevate during times of uncertainty but then always gives it back this market if this market can really build on a record high then that is a strong signal from the financial markets that they do not trust <laughs> our financial authorities yeah again i didn't disagree with anything you've said this episode i come at it differently I like, I'm just doing math. I wasn't alive during a lot of this shit that you're saying. So I just read shit online and I do math. If debt to GDP gets over 350%, you're on the brink of it collapsing. That's just, that's how Rome fell. That's what I've read. I wasn't born, but it's just what I read. And so I think it's just the, the debt has cut just by the way, guys, debt to GDP the way to think about that is how much is borrowed versus how much growth you're seeing. So you're borrowing from your future. The only way to pay that back is to arrive at the future with more than you borrowed, right? So you're borrowing from your future to spend it now and you want to get to the future with more than what you borrowed from it. That means you're whole on the investment plus some. If you're not though, then there's a hole in the balance sheet. So there's that that ratio is now over 350%, which supposedly according to history is like once you get to that level, then there's no good outcome. You can't raise rates, can't lower rates. It's all bad. And and so I I think it's like, you know, it's not Jerome Powell's fault. I don't think there's a right person to run the Fed. Um, I think gold, every, Bitcoin, everything's just reacting because I think the age of Keynesian fiat has reached its peak. It just has compounded over 100 years. And it's at the point. And, it, and, it, and there's a lot of things that worry me. Like everyone that fought, Everyone that was like around World War II and is generally aware of how disastrous something like that is to all of us is gone, right? So we don't we don't really have people running countries that are aware of the mistakes that we made in like the the twenties, oh nineteen twenties, right? Um, so it feels like we have lost that level of context and learning. Um, to be dumb enough to get into another world war. Um, we've been compounding on bad habits and mistakes to a point where it's unsustainable. That's just how it feels to me. But again, I've never, I don't have historical gold, like gold rallying to me makes sense. But I've just never, I was born in 94. By the time I learned any of this stuff was like a decade ago. Well, so why do you think gold rallying makes sense? When you're at gold as a safe haven, uncertainty flight to quality play um makes sense but you don't know how much of it there is so how can i how can i take safe harbor in something with an unknown supply cap i mean I it has reasonable this, unknown. but i i don't disagree with that gold's not rallying for you and i i think gold's rallying for central banks if you're a central bank that thinks that the united states is going to be violent to protect their hegemony that they've designed since world war ii and you're scared, what are you buying? You can't buy Bitcoin. It's not big enough. We've already we've talked about this. The fact like the the Bitcoin skeleton, if I'm a central bank, I mean, sure, fine. I can I I can be a central bank. Bitcoin's got a trillion dollar market cap, and I can add another trillion to it. And I'm not gonna get filled and I'm gonna fuck the market up entirely. 
I could. A gold's the only thing big enough that I can then debase my currency against as a central bank. You know, like I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed came out and like, because they mark the they mark gold on their balance sheet as worth X amount of dollars, and they're just going to devalue the dollar against gold one of these days and just say, oh, this massive pile of gold we've been sitting on is actually worth more than you guys think, right? So I just don't know, like if you're a central bank, where do you buy a bunch of penthouses in Manhattan? I don't think Bitcoin's big enough yet, but I don't think you and I should buy it. If you buy gold, I just tell to your listeners, if, if you're buying gold, you are um, you are taking somebody off the hook for the terrible investment they made. <laughs> right? You're taking somebody else's bad bag. I mean, nobody, right? Anybody long gold is regretting that decision because it hasn't protect, unless, right, you got, just on this rally. But if anybody said, anybody, like I said, watch any of the geopolitical events that have happened during my trading career and said, you know what, I'm going to put 10% of my equity in gold just for protection against inflation or insolvencies and bank runs and bombings. Um, how well has that, has gold protected you over? It really hasn't. So I, I, I just, I, you know, it, who are but you talking there are, to? There are certainly a lot of longs. So anybody buying this all time high, you are just taking someone else's bad trade. And that, that guy's, you're just making that guy, that guy whole. There's no reason there are far better ways, markets that have better, a better security argument or a better, you know, limited supply cap, a better anti inflation hedge argument. Um, there are numerous better markets than gold. Gold's just been around forever. I know, but answer the question. Who are you talking to? I'm not talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to a central bank. If I'm a central bank and I see the United States supporting the ideas of war, right. uh, getting violent, what do you buy? You, you may what is what is everybody's favorite central bank on the planet buy? What is El Salvador doing? What is Qatar doing? I mean, they're starting to ditch the dollar, right? Isn't everybody starting to head towards the exits a little just to be careful i mean you never know um but yes if, if you got if you got what dollars doing right gold um i imagine they're long that right they, they they're trying to de-dollarize and and you know 100 bitcoin like you said is is that market mature enough to handle i mean isn't that one of the things elon tried to do when he jerked the market up and down so much was to see if bitcoin is liquid and deep enough to be a a reserve asset because sometimes you do have to move big numbers around in a in a fortune 500 treasury reserve situation so you know we're we're getting there we're we're cl we're getting closer but now gold right now ha everybody's got a comfort level with it it's got thousands of years history and yeah that's I, right auction that's, against buying it that's the only reason i think it makes sense is the level of capital that needs i don't think people have the imagination for how big this bull market can get because if the us has to fix and save the bond market which they do that's what's going on like the insolvencies the bank insolvencies the bank lines that my dad's talking about is because the bond market is is that's the reason the bank's balance sheets have bonds on them the bonds are underwater that's why your deposits aren't there. So if they're going to have to fit price fix and bail out the biggest market in the world, mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone has the imagination for how big this can get. And so, and we've talked about too, is that, you know, Bitcoin is still in its issuance phase. It's still reaching its 21 million supply cap. So it's dilutive. There are new coins coming out. So the easiest example is if there were 50 Bitcoins in total after the first block, and there's going to be another block in 10 minutes that produces 50 more. If some Saudi oil money put $10 trillion into 50 Bitcoins, and then I mined 50 Bitcoins, I would have diluted them you know, by half. And so I think Bitcoin only has so much of a skeleton, which is a feature. It's a grounds up movement in my opinion is that it doesn't allow or afford anyone to corner the market if someone came in with 10 trillion dollars to an asset that's worth a trillion and tried to just own 80 percent of the supply it's mathematically impossible so it's a grounds up movement i think that's why it's resistant to these things it didn't go through an ipo listing it didn't have early access to large capital that's why all of us have our positions i don't think bitcoin can get um to a $50 trillion market cap 
um, tomorrow. I think because of, of the dilutive nature of mining right now and stuff. Um, so I don't know. I may, I don't know. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, but according to math, the dollar is going to get debased aggressively. Who knows what Bi Biden's going to blame it on Putin or Iran or Israel or Ukraine, or I have no idea or uh, COVID or something. Um, but according to math, um, they have to st start debasing it. They've tried high rates, didn't work. High rates, ran the banks insolvent, inflation's still there. Um, so they're screwed. I agree. Yeah. And I, I, do, I do think gold, just to your point, it's such a piece of shit. The fact that it's rallying, I think Bitcoin's going to go to 100K any day now. Um, I mean, I think, right, I, I do not think Bitcoin is the pure inflation signal um, because I think Bitcoin's too cheap, period. I mean, it's just, it. I don't, you know, it's, we're just getting to the point where we, we've got, you know, decent on-ramps. It was hard to get long before now with ETFs and and more, you know, corporations becoming more fluent with it and stuff. Um, no, Bitcoin um, is hard to get long. It's got a supply having, it just has a better inflation protection story than gold does. Yep. Yeah. Well, TLDR, uh, our opinion on the Money Matters podcast is do nothing. Sit on your hands. Uh, unplug yeah, the computer. Get on. Get yeah. on That's one. I, it's hard to do nothing. Um, but like I said, I haven't logged into my account in a week. I don't plan on it. Um, why I'm, I have no insight into try to trade around, a, you know, a war. Um, and with all the other uncertainty and, uh, you know, inflation numbers, I don't trust election year numbers. Um, then right. Even we've all, isn't, uh, the current administration, they all do it, but I think the current administration gets, um, more suspicion of, of jerry rigging numbers and then waiting three months and revising them all <laughs> yeah. yeah so no i'm gonna um, get long get paid you guys keep printing your way out of this problem and i will watch the masters that's yep rather than try to trade my way around it hardest thing to do is doing nothing um all right let's uh transition to an entirely separate topic which is open source development let me uh try and so for those watching on youtube i'm going to try and share my screen so that you guys can see some of the stuff i put together for this for those listening on podcasting apps i'll just read all of the things i captured from the internet verbatim um but is this going to work dylan um can you see the screen here and yeah yeah okay um so i'm just i just think this is valuable i hope it's helpful. Um, we'll see. Obviously, people will let us know. Um, but for context, there's recently been some debate about Bitcoin open source development. If it's helpful, if funding developers is going to kill Bitcoin, if Bitcoin's good enough and we could just never touch it again, why would we? What are we risking killing it for? It seems to be working fine. And this isn't about like, I love and respect Odell, I love and respect Sailor. I've already made this clear. I think this conversation, it happens every single cycle. It's important to have, uh, and it's important to have it publicly as well. That's hopefully I set an example here of doing it not in group chats or not in private meetings, but doing it out in the open. That's what an open source project is all about, which Bitcoin is by definition, by the way. Um, and so this isn't at anyone individually at all. And I mean that. I've already said that, and I mean it. Um, this is just my opinion on all of the various conversation I've seen, because as I'll explain, I think it's absolutely critical that we arrive at distributed consensus. Uh, that's how the protocol works, which I'll explain in a second. So I just gathered some tweets. So I posted a video. It was like five minutes long. It was like, hey, this is what I think. And a bunch of people reacted, and I thought it would be potentially helpful to just respond literally to what people were saying. This is the best way to just pretty much answer questions. So uh, Mark said, I'm just going to read this out loud for those that aren't watching and uh, are listening on podcast apps. Mark said, my hot take on Odell versus Sailor. Bitcoin has been a completed project for a long time now. The only thing core devs can do is mess it up at this point. 
Funding them feels like the right thing to do from the heart and makes for good ETF marketing, but tinkering with the protocol just introduces more risk to Bitcoin. Bitcoin can operate as the world's best base layer of money in its current form. Don't break it. So I just wanted to respond to this real quick. A few things. Um, first of all, Bitcoin needs developers to maintain it, even if it's not building new features. Um, if you don't maintain Bitcoin, it won't last centuries to come. Like Bitcoin Core version 26.0, which is out right now, will not last us 100 years. It's unclear how long it will last us. Will it last us a decade? Will it last us a year? Maintaining open source projects, especially ones that are worth over $1 trillion, I've made this point that you know, Bitcoin is <laughs> Bitcoin is one of the only censorship-resistant distributed software networks in the world, period. On top of that, I'd make the point it's by far the biggest. Bitcoin is the only distributed censorship resistant software network that's worth over a trillion dollars so it's the biggest one operating at the scale the notion or the idea that we could never touch it ever again never maintain the libraries never update anything and assume that we can grow it to 10 trillion or 100 trillion and run the world on top of it is just listen bitcoin got here because of open source development that would be an experiment. If you think it'd be dangerous for us to maintain Bitcoin, it'd be very dangerous, in my opinion, to cannibalize the open source community that got us here and just experiment and see how Bitcoin does. That might actually break it. So I think this notion, I don't know where this is coming from, by the way, because I've been in Bitcoin for what 11 years, 10 years or something. And we've always been very clear that it's an open source project which requires maintenance. Um, I would not want my net worth not that's that's living in a software project to not be maintained. <laughs> it's, it is terrifying for anyone that's been involved in software. And so I just want to be clear about that is that we absolutely, even if we never wanted another feature and we wanted to just maintain the existing network as it is, we absolutely need open source engineers that are within Bitcoin Core and outside of Bitcoin Core, by the way, too. Bitcoin development isn't just Bitcoin Core. So I don't know if people disagree with that that's a lot of this is i'm also trying to um poke poke the nest a little bit to i can't tell if this is a lot of misunderstanding um so i don't know if that's a controversial opinion uh but if we're gonna have an open source network one of a kind that's worth over a trillion going on 10 trillion going on 100 trillion um we're going to need to maintain and support it uh and I'd be shocked if people want to start now experimenting if Bitcoin can survive without software maintenance. Yeah, but what do you think about the argument that um, um, Bitcoin kind of, it really already has, like, can, would Bitcoin be more efficient with quicker confirmations? Well, that's all Litecoin is, right? Litecoin it, it, at its um genesis was the exact same thing as bitcoin with one line of code changed right can will bitcoin flourish with larger block sizes well we already know that answer right isn't that well, what bitcoin cash is and neither litecoin nor bitcoin cash has taken a reasonable any amount of market share from bitcoin right so i, I think you kind of already we kind of we don't need to speculate on does bitcoin need changes people it's open source. People fork it and change it all the time. Charlie Lee did and um, Roger Ver did. And so you kind of have a real time answer to those questions. Yeah. And that's a I great point. That. I don't know. That's that's is Bitcoin ossifying under my thing? Ye well, Bitcoin classic is <laughs> original Bitcoin is. Um, but no, the protocol is an os is an ossifying. People can, you know, like I said, Litecoin, Charlie Lee can fork it. Roger Ver can fork it. You can create strike coin. Um, and we'll let the market, you know, decide whether whether the old chain is going to ossify or not. Yeah, right. Um, I think even more specific to your point there, people assume that open source development is building features that could ruin what we have. Let me give you guys an example. Bitcoin has a required hard fork or it's going to break. So for someone like Mark, which by the way, I don't, I don't know Mark. I'm sure he's a great guy. 
Um, I'm not trying to pick on Mark. I respect that he put his opinion out there in the public, fostering public conversation. That's what this is all about, is adults being adults and working together in a distributed manner to figure out what the future of money is going to be. But I don't, I don't know if Mark is aware that if we don't do a specific hard fork for timestamps, Bitcoin will break. So for someone that says, I don't want another line of code on Bitcoin is, is knowingly walking Bitcoin in, into failure. There are certain, there are just certain things that require us maintaining this project. And so it's not necessarily building new features or experimenting with the block size or talking about JPEGs. It's like maintaining open source software that's used by millions or tens of millions or eventually billions of people that runs the world's money needs maintenance. There are things where libraries we're going to need to update. Like every single piece of software that you use needs. Also, by the way, can I say, I run a company now that has lots of customers and moves a ton of money on an annualized basis. We use a tremendous amount of open source software. If you guys want to cannibalize and kill Bitcoin open source, well, fuck strike, you're up. Fuck Strike UK, fuck any new feature. All I would do is spend a lot of resources maintaining all this shit so I can serve you guys some semblance of Bitcoin. One of the reasons Strike can be Strike is because we stand on top of the open source community. We download and run Bitcoin Core. The Lightning Network is an open source project. If we had to do all of that on our own, so it's not just new features. I mean, this is a giant open source ecosystem that needs maintenance. And that if you guys don't run it and benefit it from it, the companies that you use do. Like Strike would not be able to work without the open source libraries that Bitcoin runs on top of, period. Um, so yeah, I just I just don't think... I, I just don't know if that's controversial or not. That's kind of why I want to cut through the fat here. I'm I'm pretty confident there's a lot of misunderstanding of what's going on is that if we don't want new features, that's fine. And maybe the free market, to my dad's point, maybe the free market arrives there because people will build new features and no one will use them. And then we'll never have new features. But the idea that we need to cannibalize open source developers from maintaining the future of money for planet Earth I mean, you just must have never been involved in software. I, I just, it's confusing. Or maybe I'm misinterpreting what you're saying. Um, but, and it's not just Mark's opinion. There's been conversation, right, of, of all over the place. So I just wanted to make that one point. And then I have a few more that I want to make a different point. So Adam writes and tweets in, I love it, Jack. The only point I'd add is the con uh, conversation of conflicts of interest. The big one lately was Bitcoin ETF supporting open source developers. If done privately, no conflict, but it needs to be private or else it just turns into some broken lobbying system we have. So it's the idea that corporations can lobby Bitcoin developers to influence the project. Another one by Dope Mind, but ETF funds funding the development teams and giving them grants is exactly what risking Bitcoin's future looks like big time. And then the last one, agreed, but I guess corporations should not have power over developers. That's all. Big funding other than small funding might come with expectations. So it's also this idea that an ETF or a big corporation funding Bitcoin open source development could somehow influence what they're working on, which influences Bitcoin, which then breaks it. And I just wanted to spend a second explaining why this isn't the case. Developers can never actually be threats to the network. Um, at least my opinion. Again, I'm a node on the network. The free market's going to find its way because that's how Bitcoin works. Um, but, you know, uh, let's go through an example. What if Vladimir Putin wanted to fund devs? You think he'd listen to Sailor or Dorsey or me on our opinion? If Vladimir Putin wanted to fund a developer and say, hey, go write code to make Bitcoin's uh, fixed supply 21 uh, billion coins, not 21 million. Go write code to make Bitcoin break. Um, the reason, guys, if that was the case, then Bitcoin wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here today. Someone would have already broke it. The reason Bitcoin's resilient to that is the only way to actually update Bitcoin is if we, the network, the people, the free market, download the code and run it on our on the nodes ourselves. So if Putin wanted to break Bitcoin, he'd have to go walk into all of our homes and update all of our computers that are running the Bitcoin nodes if he wanted to update the network. So no developer is ever an actual threat to the network. They can build whatever they want. 
The network only changes is if the people download and run their code. And so the idea of funding developers, in my opinion, developers are like the artists of the digital age. They're oftentimes misunderstood. They're very forward thinking. They're the smartest people in the room. And what you want is for them to just create. You want to give them capital. You know, you don't want to tell Van Gogh, hey, paint a picture of my family. Paint a picture of the Chicago Bears. You want, to, you want Van Gogh to be an artist. You want Van Gogh to just aimlessly create things that he thinks is art. And then people will either buy it or they won't. And it's the same thing for open source development and Bitcoin is what we want is no strings attached funding so that developers can build whatever they want. Maybe some developer builds a multi-sig open source library for companies to build. Maybe some developers go maintain Bitcoin core and make sure that Bitcoin can last for thousands of years into the future. Maybe some developers build something like Bitcoin Cash, which is an awful mistake worth nothing in an utter waste of time, but they can build whatever they want. The only way Bitcoin actually changes and progresses is if the free market, all of us, download and run the code. Let me tell a quick story about that. The block size wars. So I have a slide here for it, actually. Story time, the block size wars. Really quick to make hammer this point home. In 2016, I mean, it had been going on for a while, but I'd say 2016, it really started to ramp up. And then 2017, it really peaked. So this is, you know, seven, eight years ago at this point. There was a portion of the Bitcoin community that really wanted Bitcoin to change dramatically to accommodate for faster transactions, but could have potentially killed Bitcoin. Now, there's another portion of the community that didn't want to risk Bitcoin's death and thought we should scale via layer twos like lightning and everything. Okay. The portion of the community that wanted to change Bitcoin dramatically and potentially kill it did. Okay. And we pleaded and we said, don't fund that developer. Don't write that line of code. Please don't do this. Guess what? That's not how Bitcoin works. People are going to do whatever the fuck they want, whether they're Roger Ver or Vladimir Putin. And if we think that Bitcoin's viability as the future of money is, is, entirely predicated on the fact of us convincing developers or people what to do that's not how bitcoin works the reason we're resilient to it is we don't have to so developers did they for they built a version of bitcoin we didn't update our nodes we didn't run it that now version is bitcoin cash it's worth nothing right and so that's the free market let developers do whatever they want some developer thought it'd be a really good idea to double the block size they thought it would solve everyone's problem it didn't it's worth nothing the free market didn't value it at all let me tell you guys a story though because this is an unknown piece of the block size wars that doesn't get talked about enough we wanted to build the lightning network the lightning network required an update in bitcoin that solved the problem called transaction malleability it was just this technical i'm not going to get too technical but it's a technical problem in bitcoin that without it we'd have no lightning network okay so are you guys following so far we have transaction malleability if we don't solve it we don't have the lightning network now people have erased this from their memory but i find it critically important in today's environment for those that potentially don't know back in the day none of us knew how we were going to solve transaction malleability like as a developer community we thought it was maybe impossible to do in a straightforward way without forking the chain without causing all sorts of issues nobody had any idea okay one day two open source developers in bitcoin came up with a stroke of, of genius which was called segwit it was Luke Luke Dash Jr. and Eric Lombroso, who's not as active anymore, but historic contributor to Bitcoin. They actually came up with a way to solve this problem that was a soft fork that was rel relatively straightforward as an upgrade to the network. And that is an example of like why you just fund developers to do what they just just do what they think is best. Some developers are going to build things that suck ass and will never use. Some developers are going to do things that define how we were thinking about Bitcoin. We're like, holy shit, that is genius. That's like Van Gogh art piece. Like, wow, how did you do that? That's beautiful. And then we sit and we talk about it and we realize, wow, we could really use this thing. So we went from having no idea how we're going to get the Lightning Network, begging people that wanted to control and kill Bitcoin, please don't kill Bitcoin. 
please don't write that line of code. But Bitcoin survives because unless we update our nodes, it doesn't matter. So a bunch of people that thought Bitcoin needed to change, tried to change it. We didn't update our nodes. And then we were just funding developers. Like, how are we going to get things like the Lightning Network? How are we going to fix this bug transaction malleability? And some genius developer out of nowhere was just like, I found a solution. Again, just like, treat them like artists. They, they mean no harm. If they build shit that sucks, just we won't use it. If they build ingenious shit, they're going to advance the future of money. So it's like a free call option. It's like an open bounty of build me something valuable. And if the free market values it, we'll use it. If not, whatever, no harm, no foul. So the last part of this story is that we wanted this thing called said we wanted this update to make a tremendous long story short we wanted as a free market we wanted the update now bitcoin core the all evil bitcoin core that supposedly everyone thinks is dog shit and they hate they would not code the update they didn't want to do it now i'm i'm greatly greatly shortening the story for those that were there so excuse me but bitcoin core did not want to release a version with this update so here we have a bunch of people being really malicious and trying to convince people to run a version of Bitcoin that they coded. And we're, no, we don't want to run that. And we're saying, well, Bitcoin Core will give us the, the free market, the update that we want. That didn't happen either. Some developer named Sholin Fry, we don't even, I don't even know this person's full name. Some random developer built a version of Bitcoin with the update that we all wanted, and we all as a free market ran it and updated Bitcoin. Now, I hope this, the point I'm trying to make here is that like we didn't use Bitcoin Core to update Bitcoin. Like we don't, we didn't, Bitcoin Core didn't want to do what the free market wanted us to do. Roger Ver didn't do what the free market wanted us to do. Some random motherfucker did. But the free market is who's in control. The nodes are who's in control. Is it if we update and update our nodes and we run whatever version of Bitcoin, that's what Bitcoin is. So it doesn't matter if some ETF, if BlackRock, if Larry Fink wants to spend a trillion dollars funding developers to change the supply of Bitcoin. The supply of Bitcoin will never change until Larry Fink walks in my house and updates my computer himself and then does that 8 billion times over with everyone else running Bitcoin. Does that make sense? So this idea that like an ETF would have an outsized influence on Bitcoin development, go for it. And by the way, guys, if that was a real risk, Bitcoin's dead on arrival. What's going to happen when Putin wants to have an outsized influence? All that matters is that we don't update the code on our machines. That's how Bitcoin works. So I just deeply don't understand when people are like, oh no, uh, we don't want corporate, like guys, the way Bitcoin works, and this already happened. This already happened. Corporations tried to take over Bitcoin. We didn't run the code. Bitcoin Core didn't give us a version of the software we wanted. So the free market did it itself. And then we updated. And the reason you're using the Lightning Network today is because of that story I just told. That's what happened. We didn't use Bitcoin Core to get it. And we didn't use Roger Ver. The free market is is the, the nodes on the network. The free market of Bitcoin is the dictator of what the future is. So let developers do whatever they want. This is why we have things like OpenSats, HRF, Brink, Chain Code Labs. These are 501c3. These are places you can give capital, no strings attached, and they have relationships with engineers and developers, and they go to conferences. And the capital goes, and we just let the most talented engineers in the world create art for the future of money. And if the art's good, the free market will buy it. If the art's dog shit, the free market won't. But we are, so if we don't ever want a new feature of Bitcoin, we'll just never up, we'll, but the argument isn't to people that want to fund developers, and the argument isn't to the developers. The argument's with each other. The argument is go on a podcast, be a fucking man, and talk about it like I am right now. Is that like, I think no matter what, we're going to need to maintain an open source library that's going to be the future of money for planet Earth. That's my opinion. I used to be a software engineer. I'm telling you right now, it's going to break if we don't fund developers to maintain it at the very least. And But it's, it's about 
distributed consensus and arriving at places of like what updates to the code do we want but i just i'm i hope that there's just like potentially confusion around so this idea that we don't need like we need to cannibalize open source entirely and we're just going to test running bitcoin without an open source community for the first time in its history seems incredibly dangerous and then the idea that developers are a threat or that blackrock can be a threat to bitcoin by funding developers go for it we'll just never update to that code Good luck. You're the new Roger Ver, Larry Fink. Welcome to the fucking show. You know, um, it doesn't matter. And if if developers build something ingenious or amazing, or if Bitcoin Core just has newer updates with newer libraries that make it last centuries to come, great, amazing. If you don't ever, by the way, want to update your Bitcoin uh, Core version, you don't have to. If you want to ossify Bitcoin and what that means to you is never updating Bitcoin Core, don't. Anyway, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, but uh, you know the, the 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 problem I have really is that um, it's it's um, distributed consensus is difficult. Sometimes people get their feelings hurt. The the reality is Bitcoin is not centrally planned. You just got to be a fucking adult and have conversations like this. But it just has to be in the public. You can't have things not to the public eye. You know, I think that you should just, we should all just be encouraging of, okay, I'm going to grab a bunch of your tweets, make sure that I try and articulate why I think it's a giant misunderstanding. Developers can never be threatening to Bitcoin. We absolutely are going to need an open source community because Bitcoin's an open source project. <laughs> Unless you guys want to close source it and leave it up to a boardroom in New York. If you want it to be an open source project, we need open source community, period. Um, and this is how Bitcoin progresses, in my experience. You guys call me an asshole. You can say I'm a dick. You can say I'm wrong. And I'd have to accept that and respect it if that's the free market's opinion. But in my experience in this industry, you suit up, be a fucking man, and give your opinion to the public in an effort of being constructive and, and progressive in moving this project to where it needs to go. So I think this is a giant misunderstanding. I'd be shocked, shocked, out of my mind shocked. If the collective opinion of this $1.3 trillion asset is that we need to take away the development maintenance of it, I'd be shocked if that was the opinion. And I think it's a misunderstanding that developers can threaten the project because if that was the case, the project would have died a long time ago. Bitcoin's resistant to that and it's resistant to that in a distributed manner because you'd have to update all of our computers. So the power lives in the people running the software in the distributed network, not those developing it. Miners don't control it. Developers don't control it. The people that control Bitcoin are the people that run it, which is all of us. If one person forks off, it, it's the majority has to progress the project. Anyway, rant over. I don't know if you guys have thoughts or questions on that, but... Yeah, I, mean, I know everybody... Um, When anybody says, boy, Satoshi Nakamoto is a genius for inventing all of that, but he really didn't invent anything. If you if you look at it, what he his genius was was taking existing inventions, right, existing advancements, and just aligning incentives is is the genius of the system. Is is how he made it self sustaining through really through just in aligning incentives, right? Um, um, it, it is a, an enormously uh, an enormous balancing act, but it is to the point now where just in our time, we have seen whether it's IRS crackdowns, China bans Bitcoin, um, or whatever this is, rogue devs breaking off from the project. Um, it is the original defense against that distribution with properly aligned incentives is kind of magic. Right? <laughs> it really is. And that's why you want to give Satoshi credit for a lot. People give him probably too much credit because as he says, he is really furthering the work of, you know, look at all those references of, of you know, Adam Bax at all. Um, but none of them were able to sustain a system because of the of the difficulty of, of achieving resilience without, you know, rules without a rule maker without um centralization and that was done really through uh, the miracle of incentives so I, yeah. I, 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 agree. I, I really do think i mean i'll just calm myself down i really think it's a, <laughs> i think it's just a misunderstanding i think at the end of the day 
we all agree a lot more than the public discourse is letting off to be, but maybe not. Maybe this goes live and people disagree even more than I thought. But I think the reality is no one is advocating for us ex taking on an experiment, you know, 15 years into Bitcoin, trillion dollar market cap later. Now we're going to start trying what Bitcoin, if Bitcoin can survive without a vibrant open source community. I don't think anyone fucking Dorsey, Siller, Odell, Larry Fink, I don't think anyone would ever advocate for that. And in my experience, developers aren't a threat to Bitcoin because of the way Satoshi designed it, as my dad just said. The way he designed it, or she or they, is that the distributed network is the one that determines the future of the free market. Developers can build whatever they want. I can go right now and edit a line of code that would break Bitcoin. But unless all of you update and run it, I can't break it. And so that's the reality. And so in my opinion, what we want, listen, Bitcoin has created over a trillion dollars of new wealth. That is not an opinion. That's a fact. Bitcoin was worth zero. Now it's worth a trillion. Where's that money going? Those that are holding it, those that have been a part of this new wealth transfer. We as a community can plenty afford giving no strings attached funding to developers so that they can build what they think is best. And, and I, the way I think of developers, again, is like artists. It's like the artists of the digital age. Sometimes they're misunderstood, but they're the most forward thinking. They're the smartest in the room. They come up with ideas that were previously incomprehensible. You want them to just create, create art. And if we value the art, we can incorporate it into the network as a free market. If we don't, we won't. It doesn't really matter. But we absolutely want to fund a vibrant open source community because Bitcoin's an open source project. It's the only way it's going to continue to survive. All of the companies you use, use it. All of the individuals that run Bitcoin, use it. It would be terrifyingly dangerous to just experiment without any open source community anymore. So real quick, to end my slides here, um, I there's a few people that said, for example, is there a 501c3 organization set up for developers? Instead of sending my annual tax deductible donations to various orgs that I don't really care about, I wish I could send to the developers and get a tax deduction. Anyone know? Why isn't this publicized all over? I agree. Simple question. If I want to personally send SATs to developers, is there a simple way to do so? As in a list of developers with receiving wallet addresses, etc. Or the last one, how do we actually participate in the open source funding though, Jack? Is there somewhere I can send a donation? Is there somewhere we can volunteer time toward helping out? I already tell my friends and family about Bitcoin and send them hardware wallets for Christmas, etc. So I love this. And the answer is absolutely. So I have a few answers for this. Um, open Sats. Open Sats. Now, it was co founded by Odell. So take it for what it's worth. I mean, I personally love Matt and his contributions to Bitcoin. He's one of my favorite all time Bitcoiners. He's a good friend of mine. But he has a, they, Open Sats is a 501c3. It's currently run by Gigi. So, yes, if you want tax deductible Bitcoin donations, 501c3. And the reason the community has set these up, guys, is so that you don't have to go directly to developers. You can give money to open sats, no strings attached, and they have relationships with engineers that are working on all sorts of stuff. Maybe some of it's Bitcoin Core. Maybe some of it's just maintenance of libraries. Maybe some of it is multi-sig open source libraries for companies to use. All of it is very valuable to the progressing Bitcoin forward and allowing us all to replace existing base money with Bitcoin. And that's in a great example of like what these ETFs are doing, right, is just giving money to something like Brink. They're not directly to developers and say, we just want Bitcoin to be better. We want artists to create art. And if any of the art's valuable, we'll use it. So there's OpenSats, there's Brink. I don't know if Chaincode accepts donations, um, but Chaincode's a, an awesome name in the space. HRF is another really good one. And then the last answer I have for you is... Strike has a 501c3 that does this. I've never been public about it um, because, I don't know, it's just, you know, we weren't doing it for any other reason than we wanted a 501c3 to funnel our own contribution. So for those of you that don't know, in 2021, we ran the Indy 500 Bitcoin car. An Indy 500 racer reached out to me, wanted to do something with Bitcoin. I told him, if you race the Bitcoin car, 
we'll raise a bunch of money for open source development. And we did that. Michael Saylor was one of the biggest donors, for example, Ross Stevens of Nidig and Stone Ridge, another big donor. It was amazing. And through that effort of donating that amount of money to open source developers, I created a 501c3. Now, it's like, there's no, we don't make money on it. All we've done is take strikes capital. Um, and we've done like a lot of work with the Human Rights Foundation, for example. A lot of their Bitcoin open source development donations were funded by me. If you guys also, I'm going to try and make this more public in the coming weeks, given the timing of all of this conversation. Um, and we'll try, we'll try and make it more accessible. But we also have a 501c3 that now if there is an urge, we've never really accepted too many outside donations outside of like something like a Michael Saylor or a Ross Stevens tied to an event. Um, but if there, that's of interest and you would want to give to me and to strike and we will funnel to open source projects that we think is valuable, um, we also have a 501c3. So I'd be curious what the community thinks about that. This is not self-serving in any way. We don't make money on it, obviously. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, but if the community has interest in saying, I'd rather do tax deductible to you, Jack, and hear how you're going to use it to fund Bitcoin open source development, we also have one. So the point that I'm trying to make is there are many. It's not some centralized idea. Bitcoin Core doesn't have just some office in New York City that they all meet and decide the future of Bitcoin. It's not how it works. There are a ton of ways to donate to Bitcoin open source development. I will put them on Twitter. I'll put them somewhere if you're just listening on podcasts. Um, we even have one. We've never made it public. It's been serving our own self-interest internally for a lot of the work that I want to see in Bitcoin open source development that I believe should get funded. So a lot of it, by the way, has nothing to do with strike like cashew. Like, um, I, I think eCash is, is cool for people to experiment with for artists to try and create art. I have no idea if it's going to work or not. I have no fucking clue, but I think it's badass, And I think it, Bitcoin's done so much for me. Um, I think it's worth giving it a try. So shit like that. Anyway, that's the answer to the question is yes, there's absolutely places to go. But hopefully this was helpful. It's just very like raw, authentic emotion for me. I'm very jet lagged um, getting off this plane. Hopefully I was articulate enough, articulate enough, but developers aren't a threat. I think you lost lives now, but I, Brooke and I understood. <laughs> no, I mean, Bitcoin, our developers aren't a threat to Bitcoin. You can't change Bitcoin without all of us updating it. So let people build whatever they want. You could be Putin and you still can't kill Bitcoin. It was that's the whole reason it's still here is designed to be resilient to that. Um, and the idea that now we want to experiment without any open source maintenance of an open source project that's worth a trillion dollars seems out of left field and incredibly dangerous. Now that would be a way to kill Bitcoin. If you want to say, hey, all, all you developers, you're now homeless. Get the fuck out. Fuck you. Um, and by the way, sorry, I, I really need to shut up. But one more thing, the open source Bitcoin community just got through the Craig Wright shit, guys. Like, think of, put yourself in the shoes of an open source Bitcoin developer that has helped manifest a trillion dollar open source, open source asset that's giving the world hope. And you've day in, day out, written code, having no idea if anyone was going to use it, right? Like I'm saying, as developers, it's very tough. Sometimes developer writes code and the free market's like, fuck you and your code. And you have to say, okay, that sucks. I wasted years of my life on a proposal to Bitcoin that I thought would be helpful and the free market didn't like it at all. So these people work tirelessly maintaining Bitcoin, supporting Bitcoin, getting it to where it is. Craig Wright comes along, sues them to death, threatens their life, threatens their livelihood. And we, like people like Dorsey, funding literally all of the legal to get these people through court, protect their liberties, allow them to continue to contribute to Bitcoin. There's been very dark times in the Bitcoin development ecosystem of developers quitting. I mean, the problem we have in open source development is actually not as much around funding. It's lack of developers. Developers used to grow year over year. As Bitcoin's become more important, the most talented minds in the world want to see if they can help. And that's starting to slow down. And that's really the concern that I talk to people about is how can we protect these people and not, they're getting sued to oblivion by people like Craig Wright. And so if we come, we just fought through the Craig Wright shit. If on the back half of Craig Wright shit, community is going to say, fuck, fuck you developers. We don't want to pay you. Fuck you. Um, man, you know, that would be tough. Uh, That'd be tough. And again, it just doesn't make sense to me. So just some more context on that. I mean, these people, they cannot harm you. 
they cannot harm you unless you update and run the code. So um, <laughs> also just keep that in mind. They're, a lot of them are coming off lawsuits. A lot of them at one point were scared for their lives. Um, and I don't, just don't know where a lot of this hate is coming from for the people that, you know, very much got us all into the position that we're in in the first place. Without them, we wouldn't be here. All right. Amen. Cookie likes it. Yeah, I got nothing to add to that. I agree 100% with everything you said. Cool. That section felt necessary. Um, okay. Well, uh, I think if nothing else, we can let Lito go to Coachella. <laughs> nothing else. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin protocol produces 900 uh, Bitcoins a day and times that by $63,000. Um, is the amount of new money that is coming into Bitcoin to sustain the current price. And in five days, it is only going to take half of that. Mm -hmm. um, what is, uh, how that's going to manifest. Uh, it, I've traded through two halvings before and it, it doesn't work out like you think it's going to. I, um, it doesn't, I mean, you would think it would have all, an instant reaction in the price level, but often it doesn't. Often it, that's markets. Markets have a hard time um accommodating a consensus opinion but uh whatever's gonna happen i'm telling you you got in an in an era of etf approvals a much an industry that is much much improved on ramps um you don't have to write 12 words down anymore you have um institutional uh you know uh you have hedge fund you know micro strategies out there it is much easier to get long and like I said, it's going to take half the amount to maintain this current price. It's going to have a price reaction. It's like I said, it's not going to it's not going to be as easy as you think. It's probably going to shake everybody out. But um, I don't know. So where do you think the price of Bitcoin is going to be six months from now? And I, I, it's hard to imagine with with all the new avenues of demand and half the new issuance. It's going to be an exciting market. Agree. Yeah. The next time we talk to the money matters listeners I, bitcoin will have halved well the new I, supply will have halved so if you got it. any ability right um to trade this market you are going to have to wait another four years before you get to see another one so i i'm 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 i intend on trading it um this is probably going to be one of the last halvings where it's just us right it, it, the market is getting so much more institutional and so much you know harder um yeah, so much harder to trade uh with with the bigger players involved you know it used to be like i said it used to be trading against uh retail customers uh you know who trade who discuss their trade ideas on reddit now you're then you're trading with some institutions you know the michael sailors and now you know you're trading against fidelities and etfs it's just going to get harder um so enjoy this coming having Agree. Agree. It's a good place to end it. Um, as always, uh, you guys can give us feedback, comments, questions. Uh, let us know. I mean, we can always do segments like that as well on open source development or any ongoing conversation in the space. Uh, so we'll be here every single Monday per usual. Happy having. Enjoy. The hardest thing to do is doing nothing. So good luck hodling. It's more difficult than people like Dave Portnoy will make you think. <laughs> and with that uh we'll see you guys in the comments appreciate Thanks, it guys. by the dip peace